Mike has got so many great stories because not only did he retire as a Marine, then came to Forces Command and spent 30 years. Mike went through 14 four-star generals. And let me tell you, he went through them. I remember General Singlop says, now, what's that guy's name? Mike, Mike, and I said, ha Hamer. And he said, oh, okay. And the point was, whenever you needed a question answered, whether it be desk ops or, or um, the, even the reserves or National Guard, Mike knew it. And he briefed each and every one of them. And, but the, some of the stories he has, he's going to talk about one today, but I want him to speak in a couple of months on the 14 generals that he worked for. Because these four stars were phenomenal guys. You don't reach four star unless you are. I really believe that. And so, Mike, come on up and let's get this show rolling because it's it's he's got some great stuff for us. And look at the guy. He wore his uniform today. Can you believe that? I am proud to be a Vietnam veteran. And when I'm, when I'm finished with this, you'll understand. So Army Forces Command, Fort McPherson, Georgia, four-star command. And I'm going to tell you about, I'll give you a little synopsis of what Force Com's role in Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And there's a video that will explain everything. In 1990, in August, the Force Com commander, four-star, commanded all of the active duty combat, combat service and combat service support units in the United States and all the USAR and Army Reserve units. And he commanded the National Guard units when they were mobilized, federalized, or brought on active duty. So at the time Saddam invaded Kuwait, he commanded about one million soldiers. So how did we go about this? Well, first we had to deploy the active forces, so we had them moving to the ports, had to have units to help them, and then every day the advanced party that went to Saudi Arabia would send requirements by type unit back to Forcecom, it came in at 0300 every morning. And it would be type units, and the call them initially was for PSYOPs and civil affairs and medical. And we sourced those. And sourcing means that we worked with the Guard and Reserve and we decided which unit was going to be called up. And then we wrote the mobilization orders, sent them to the Pentagon, and then they were issued, and the units would come on active duty and go to their mobilization stations. <clears throat> uh, one thing in particular, we had the media did a number on us, as it always does, all through the beginning of when it's in August, in the month of August, and so because of what they describe of the way of the Republican guards and all of the soldiers that Iraq had and all the equipment and tanks, and they built these elaborate tank traps all over the desert in Kuwait so that if one of our tanks got into it, he's not going to get out. Uh, and, and the media built that and showed maps. And so the Pentagon told us to plan for a casualty shelf of 40,000. And so we did. We called up hospitals. We called up surgical hospitals, evac hospitals, general hospitals, and we even sent some hospitals active duty that were already there out of Germany into the theater. So I'm going to go ahead now and play the video, Ed, and we'll, when I get through, I'll give you some more information. symbol of a thousand forms of duty. Water all we did in the Persian Gulf, we sent Forscom to the Persian Gulf. It was Forscom who gave General Schwarzkopf the initial wherewithal to begin accomplishing the mission given to him by the President of the United States. When we call up the National Guard and mobilize the Army Reserve, uh, Forces Command is a command of over one million men and women. Largest uh, command in the Department of Defense. Our missions, our most important missions certainly, are to be prepared to deploy and fight in support of our four deployed forces throughout the world. 
and secondly and very importantly to respond to true contingencies crisis areas where we have no forward deployed forces traveled on the fifth arrived in the uh, morning of the sixth and secretary cheney along with his party met with the uh, king of saudi arabia a number of times during the course of that day by early evening uh, the decision had been made that uh, the President of the United States would commit U.S. forces to uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, my good friend Chuck Horner, Chuck is the uh, Air Force Commander of Central Command, and I got on a plane, a uh, little C-12, headed back to Riyadh, and as we were uh, on the plane, about the only thing racing through my mind was the fact that uh, here I am at Pearl Harbor, and within a matter of hours, I'm going to have to execute the Normandy invasion. Uh, believe me, that uh, is an absolutely overwhelming set of circumstances. My good friend Chuck turned to me and said, I've got my uh, wings and squadrons en route to Saudi Arabia, John. What is it you have to uh, defend my air forces once they're at the air bases? And I reached into my pocket. I had with me one of my Third Army pen knives, and I said, Chuck, that's it. That's your first line of defense. Forces Command, Fort McPherson, Georgia, 8,000 miles from the Arabian Desert. On the evening of 6 August, the order came into the Forcecom Operations Center. Forcecom Operations. Roger. We'll need the team chief. The mission? Send a rapid deployment force to draw a line in the sand. Forcecom would launch Operation Desert Shield. That call would begin the fastest large-scale deployment of ground forces in history. And time was critical. The clock was ticking on the unknown plans of the Iraqi leader, Saddam Hussein. Forcecom immediately ordered the 18th Airborne Corps at Fort Bragg, North Carolina into action. Deploy the DRB, the Division Ready Brigade of the 82nd Airborne Division to Saudi Arabia. The DRB, always ready to deploy anywhere on short notice, quickly answered the call. The 18th Airborne Corps Assault CP was the first aircraft on the ground, followed closely uh, by the first DRB of the 82nd Airborne. At the time, our capabilities and our strength was roughly around 600 men and basically we were a deterrence towards uh, any further movement into Saudi Arabia. Didn't really know what to expect, you know, didn't know if we'd be fighting as soon as we got off. You know, we weren't really sure what we were going to be doing. The heat, and that was the first thing we noticed was the heat hit us real hard stepping off the plane. In those early days of August, the line in the sand was a thin one. The paratroopers of the 82nd were a tripwire force. Speed bumps in the desert. The objective of Desert Shield was to deter further Iraqi aggression and defend Saudi Arabia. To do that, Central Command would need a lethal combat force that could stop the heavy armored threat. Forcecom worked feverishly to thicken the line in the sand. The first week of the operation was very hectic. Because we had a concept of forces to be employed, you know, we were essentially in a no-plan situation, in that we had major forces identified beforehand, but that rapidly expanded even beyond those initial concepts. From the Forcecom Operations Center, Orders went out across the country to Fort Stewart, Georgia, and the 24th Mechanized Infantry Division, the 197th Mechanized Infantry Brigade at Fort Benning, Georgia, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and the 101st Airborne Division, Air Assault, at Fort Hood, Texas, the 1st Cavalry Division, the Tiger Brigade of the 2nd Armored Division, and elements of the 13th Corps Support Command. 
the 1st Corps Support Command, 18th Airborne Corps Artillery, and the remainder of the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg. At Fort Bliss, Texas, the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment and the 11th Air Defense Artillery Brigade. At Fort Eustis, Virginia, the 7th Transportation Group. At Fort Sill, Oklahoma, two field artillery brigades from 3 Corps Artillery and others. Virtually every Army installation in the United States would get the call to send combat power or support units to the Gulf. Once in country, all United States military forces would belong to Central Command, CENTCOM, led by General Norman Schwarzkopf. The Army forces would come under the command of ForceCom's Deputy Commanding General, its third Army commander, Lieutenant General John Yosok. Yosok's third Army headquarters would be known as ARCENT, Army Forces Central Command. We were building everything on the fly as we were going, and quite frankly, my initial concerns were the very, very basics. Uh, get a place where the troops can get out of the sun, get them uh, water, get them food, and basic sanitation. It was that rudimentary initially. I mean, it was an absolute bare-bones, austere uh, initial start on that operation. For the first time in more than 30 years, the Army's reserve component was called up in large numbers. As they have for more than 200 years, America's citizen soldiers responded to the call. From 2,500 communities, families proudly sent off their sons and daughters when duty called. The Reserve Forces, the Army National Guard, and the United States Army Reserve were ready. These guys are off there as civilians. They want to come. They were leaning forward in the foxholes. Some of them were reporting to their armories without being told. Mr. Aiden! Yeah. Guard units from every state, Puerto Rico, the District of Columbia, Guam, and the Virgin Islands, played an important role in Desert Shield. Today's Army National Guard is a well-trained, well-equipped force, available to the President and to the Congress in time of national emergency that will provide combat, combat support, and combat service support units. They will be integrated into the total force under the Command of Forces Command, who supervises and provide guidance for their training and for their wartime mission. Musarks. Major United States Army Reserve commands across the nation also sent their units to carry out vital missions. The primary mission of the reserve component as an entity is combat support and combat service support during a protracted military operation such as Desert Storm and Desert Shield. The Army Reserve provides more than 53% of total Army capability in combat support and combat service support. To assist reservists during the call-up, the Continental United States Armies were there every step of the way. These canoeses guided the mobilization and deployment activities of their designated reserve units. Their main link to the reservists, readiness groups, teams of active duty experts. They would really home in on these units to see exactly what they need. Trucks, radio, equipment, uh, chemical equipment, uh, selected personnel shortages that are that they've had short for some time, we got to fill, so we uh, we go out, people from our readiness groups go out to the unit at the alert stage and do this detailed assessment. And every mobilized unit was assigned a mobilization assistance team, a MAT, to help in the transition to active duty. To mobilize the reserves uh, is not a simple task uh, and to mobilize and deploy the reserves overseas into uh, to a possible theater of combat operations uh, is simply requires a headquarters a staff uh, that is committed to that particular objective and then I asked the state agent generals to to go all out 
to cross level right to state before they get the mobilization station. For the reserve side of the house, I asked the ARCOM commander, the other MUSARC commanders, to get involved, do all the cross leveling we can with volunteers and so forth uh, for personnel. So that when they get the mobilization station, they are in as good a shape as the state agent general or the MUSARC commander can get them in. Across the country, Army posts became mobilization stations overnight. Their mission? To get the reservists ready, to check their equipment, to provide training assistance, and to validate the unit's readiness to perform their missions. By the end of the Gulf crisis, roughly 140,000 guardsmen and reservists in more than 1,000 units mobilized. They were medical, legal, supply, signal, intelligence, quartermaster, and personnel administration units, mechanics, mail handlers, port workers, well drillers, MPs, finance clerks, radio operators, and more. They were called up to drive trucks, haul ammo, pump fuel, fly helicopters, bake bread, and purify water. Most of them deployed to the desert Others remained in the United States to perform sustaining base missions. They opened up the ports. They opened up the road nets. They opened up the transportation facilities. Uh, they opened up the airheads. Uh, they were the guys who, uh, the, the CONUS base support, who opened the pipeline at our end to flow the people through. massive undertaking by land, sea, and air. Equipment was combat loaded, checked, and shipped in unprecedented numbers. At the peak, there was one ship every 50 miles from the east coast to Saudi Arabia. A plane took off every 11 minutes around the clock. 31 billion pounds of cargo, the equivalent of 12 lanes of bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic from New York to Los Angeles moved to the Gulf. Troops and their equipment left from roughly 100 airfields and seaports, and coordinating the flow was Forces Command. Desert Shield and Desert Storm was a total force effort that took close cooperation of all the major commands. Central Command, RCENT, Department of the Army, Transportation Command, Army Materiel Command, and Defense Logistics Agency. We also worked very closely with the Air Force and the Navy. Military and civilian, active and reserve, worked together around the clock. There were no hours. Everybody just worked. It was constant. Uh, you stayed until somebody threw you out because there was always the pressure to get the job done, get it done now, get it done yesterday. Get the forces ready, get the planes ready, get the ships ready. And at home, families said their farewells. A threat loomed in the desert, and goodbyes were not easy. My wife tried to take it as strong as she could. We had a little crying period and everything, but all in all, she took it real, real, real strong. She understands what I'm in, how much I love it, and how much it means to me. To help the spouses of deployed service members, family assistance centers and support groups provided much needed services. We had our assistance center set up and our lines coming in, and the first call, one of the first calls we got was from a bilingual or a bicultural family member. German was, or appeared to be, sounded to be her, her first language. And unfortunately, the staff person we had on the desk or on the phone at the time did not speak German, but had enough wherewithal to keep the young family member on the phone till he could get a hold of our bicultural family member coordinator, get a translator to come down to the center and interpret what the young woman wanted. The Army leadership was, was very concerned about families uh, left behind uh, from the, when the soldiers deployed and set up programs designed to make sure that they uh, were adequately, their needs were addressed adequately. I took over 137 people, 15 of them female, and the one 
promise that I made to the families that I would do my damnedest to bring them back the same way they gave them in my care. By mid-October, enough combat power had arrived in Saudi Arabia to give Central Command a credible defensive force. In the heat of the Arabian desert, Arsent built a theater from nothing. Bases sprang up where only scrub or ripples in the sand had been. Early in Desert Shield, Forcecom had sent its chief logistician, Major General Gus Pagonis, to Saudi Arabia to run the enormous logistics support. The 22nd Support Command, made up largely of reserve component units, was created to manage theater logistics. All of writing the print, whatever, is about the 877 court, all this, but the 123rd out of Goodwater, Alabama, feeds them. Wherever they lived, American soldiers did what they do best, adapt to surroundings with humor, discipline, and commitment to their mission. People were collecting uh, snakes and different things. Uh, they finally got, uh, scorpions was the big one. Uh, one of the platoons finally fa caught a mouse, uh, or a desert rat. Uh, uh, and uh, the desert rat ate all the scorpions, so it solved my problem. We was in the port probably a, a couple of days before we started getting mail from uh, to any service member, and uh, our our first bunch of mail was uh, from kindergartens to about the sixth grade, and uh, we actually, I say, 80% of the company actually wrote these uh, kids back to include myself, and uh, it was a uh, uh, really a morale builder to get that uh, mail from someone you didn't know. And they trained endlessly. And there was the unknown factor, the chemical threat. Do I have any questions? Sir? Yeah, I got a question. Yes, sir. What's the standard for putting on a protective mask? What's the standard? How many seconds? Who knows? Nine seconds. Nine seconds. Nine seconds, Nine seconds right? Gas, gas, gas! In November, President Bush decided to give Central Command an offensive capability. Seventh Corps in Europe and additional force comm units were alerted. We had a mark on the wall. 15 January. The 1st Infantry Division and other active and reserve units were deployed. Most went to the Persian Gulf. Some went to Germany to backfill elements of the 7th Corps sent to join Arsent. By the end of this phase of deployment, more than 300,000 soldiers would be under Arsent's command. Force comms duties were not limited to supporting Desert Shield. As soon as the 18th Corps deployed, we immediately reconstituted the Contingency Corps. This time it was I-Corps, and they were ready to respond to other hot spots throughout the world. Meanwhile, we had units uh, down in South America in nation-building operations, and we had a major uh, full-court press going on in the counter-narcotics war. Our support in that area increased even as the crisis was ongoing. Uh, frequently, we have to uh, participate with the states and the governors in uh, support of natural disasters. We were prepared to do that. In some cases, did in, in fact react to that type of a mission. Uh, another mission that uh, folks don't understand frequently that uh, we get deeply involved in is land defense of the continental U.S. We're not talking about the Russians coming. We're talking about key asset protection from terrorism. And at Fort Stewart, Fort Hood, and the National Training Center, National Guard combat brigades called up from Georgia, Louisiana, and Mississippi trained for possible combat. But this outfit took those challenges with the National Training Center. This brigade is ready to do what it must do if it's called war. As the war clouds in the desert grew darker, another force comm unit prepared to lead the way. This time, into Operation Desert Storm. 
17 January, south of Baghdad. An attack helicopter task force from the 101st Airborne Division unleashed its fury. We had to take out some radars so that the fighters could get in and have the bombs off their aircraft and be breaking before Baghdad knew what was happening to them. And about six kilometers out, we, we came to basically a hover, just creeping real slowly forward, but, but basically a hover. And I'm sitting here looking at my watch because I'm the guy that's having to make the call to fire the missiles. And so I'm now I'm watching my clock and I've also got my finger on the, the trigger. I see it hit zero and then said. They said, yeah, we're opening up this quarter, and it never clicked in my mind that basically the whole United States Air Force was going to be coming to that quarter. So I figured, you know, a couple of jets here and there, and that wasn't it. There was one after another, and it was just uh, one of the Air Force guys, when we got back into Saudi Arabia, he, he coined the term aluminum overcast, and that's, that is literally what it looked like. There were just so many of them. airstrikes relentlessly attacked strategic targets and shaped the battlefield for the coming round war. You're basically in sight of the Kuwaiti border and you actually got to see the uh, B-52s dropping bombs on uh, uh, off of the distance. I would not have wanted to be underneath that barrage. And on the ground, arson led units prepared a surprise for the Iraqis who expected a frontal assault in the east. Speeding westward across the desert, the 18th Airborne Corps and the 7th Corps repositioned for a bold flanking attack. 235,000 troops, 64,000 vehicles, hundreds of thousands of tons of ammunition and supplies moved in endless convoys. Logistics bases Charlie and Echo mushroomed in the sand, each 40 square mile areas. Meanwhile, Iraq answered Allied airstrikes with Scud missiles aimed at Saudi and Israeli cities. The Scuds launched a new American hero, the Patriot missiles of the 11th Air Defense Artillery Brigade. As the ground war neared, our center troops made final preparations. The 1st Cavalry Division occupied defensive positions to safeguard against an Iraqi spoiling attack. The 1st Team's long-range artillery fires and feints across the border helped maintain deception. Iraq was still expecting a frontal assault. As the minutes to the start of the ground war fell away, our sent soldiers were poised to become the thunder and lightning of Desert Storm. Everybody's really ready to get this, to get this going, you know, to go ahead and knock this on out. 0400, 24 February. Combat engineers, both active and reserve, breached minefields, trenches, and wire to make way for Allied forces. Field artillery devastated the Iraqi positions. Division and Corps artillery units, along with two National Guard field artillery brigades, showered the Iraqis with howards of fire and the deadly steel rain of MLRS rockets. A brigade of the 82nd Airborne joined the 6th French Light Armored Division to seal off the western part of the battlefield. As they protected the coalition's left flank, the rest of the 82nd carried out follow-on support missions. The screaming eagles of the 101st Airborne Division air assault struck deep into the Euphrates Valley to cut Iraqi supply lines and routes of escape. Attached to 7th Corps, the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One, cleared 16 lanes through border fortifications and minefields and opened the door to Kuwait for the British 1st Armored Division. 
the 24th Mechanized Infantry Division and the 197th Mechanized Infantry Brigade fought alongside 7th Corps units in the main attack caught Iraqi tank turrets pointed the wrong way. From its initial blocking position, the 1st Cavalry Division marched more than 180 miles to form the left flank of 7th Corps. The brave rifles of the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment joined in the slashing attack that destroyed the northernmost divisions of the Republican Guard. Meanwhile in the east, the Tiger Brigade of the 2nd Armored Division added its armored punch to the Marine forces attacking into Kuwait. After 100 hours, President Bush suspended offensive operations. But I have all the tanks, all the Bradleys, all the ITBs, and all the mortars that I started with. Just the whole four days was like one big blur, because it just seemed unreal that it was actually happening this war, because like I said before, it felt so much like an exercise. But you're in the middle of these oil fires, and it looked like this side of Armageddon. The Iraqi army was in shambles. More than 4,000 tanks destroyed. Over 80,000 Iraqis taken prisoner. Now, the humanitarian spirit of American soldiers emerged. Medical units that had braced for American casualties found themselves helping Kuwaiti and Iraqi civilians and wounded Iraqi soldiers. My place as a medic, I'm there to help no matter what. I thought first, how could I help these people and they were trying to kill us, but I had to leave it in God's hands. It was a M1 tank, M2 Bradley, artillery, Apache, signal and logistics triumph. The combined arms team made all this high technology equipment work. And for Forcecom, the final duty, the redeployment of units to the United States. This victory belongs to the finest fighting force this nation has ever known in its history. sons, daughters, fathers, grandsons, uncles, aunts, and we in fact are a reflection of the American people. The final analysis, the overriding reasons that we won that war so swiftly, number one, the American soldier, the best our nation has ever had, and number two, the overriding support we got from the American people. They supported us through thick and thin, day in, day out. It's not any more complicated than that, but it just doesn't get any better than that. There was a an effort that's unparalleled in history. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories real quick because I know I don't have much time. <clears throat> what you really saw was 500,000 Iraqis and whoever else was with them against 500,000 allies, mostly Americans. That puts a million soldiers on a battlefield. And it was over in 100 hours. My favorite story, we have port support activity units in the Army Reserve. At the ports, the civilians and the unions will not allow their people to pick up Army equipment, move it, put it in the ships, that sort of thing. So we had uh, an Eastern Pennsylvania unit that was happened to be at Bayonne practicing their two weeks of mobilization uh, active duty on the 1st of August. And so they, we moved them immediately to Savannah so they could help load out the 24th. 
From there, we moved into Jacksonville a few weeks later, and they loaded out the 101st, 82nd. Then we moved them down to the Gulf Coast, and they helped roll out the 2nd uh, Armored and the 1st Cav. And then when Chorskov said, I want another Corps, we haven't got enough to do this, so we transshipped 7th Corps and all of its equipment and people. We sent that PSA unit to Antwerp, and they loaded out everybody in Europe to come into the theater. Everything was supposed to be in the theater by 1 January, and everything made it except a couple of ships that were caught in port somewhere over there in the Middle East. By and large, we got it all there on time. I hope you read, listen to the statistics about the vehicles and how many of them there were that covered eight lanes of traffic from New York to Los Angeles because it's an incredible amount. Every heavy equipment transport in the military was in the theater. We shipped trucks from Europe, and we still didn't have enough truck drivers. So we called up an engineer ribbon bridge battalion from New England, sent the troops to Fort Eustis and trained them as truck drivers, and sent them to theater so they could drive trucks. The effort across the country from all the services was uh, absolutely incredible. That PSA unit got home to eastern Pennsylvania in the middle of January. Six months after they went for two weeks. <laughs> Thought that was pretty good. All right. We had, uh, in addition to the truck drivers, we had to call up our railroad unit. Transportation Corps has a real railroad engine and cars to move the ammunition because the civilians won't move military ammunition and moved that to the port. So we had a a great variety of effort from a lot of different, all the different people and everyone cooperating. For instance, there's a small company down in South Alabama that makes combat boots. They were told immediately, you stock as many people as you can in order to make 500 pairs a week rather than what you're doing now. And that's what they did. And they went to a 24-7 operation. And that happened all over the country with support people. So what's, let me tell you something about Vietnam. Vietnam veterans, you, your legacy. Because you, people talk about that, but nobody discusses it much. So I'm going to tell you your legacy, our legacy. In, those, in Desert Shield and Desert Storm, every general officer, all the colonels, many lieutenant colonels, and almost all of the senior NCOs were Vietnam veterans. At Force Com and the Pentagon and in the Reserve and National Guard areas where all this mobilization is planned and where all the plans were made to do Desert Shield and Desert Storm, a lot of us on the fly because we didn't have set plans, was all accomplished. And all those guys you saw talk on the video, except the young kids, were all Vietnam veterans, including our own Buck Wade, who's now moved to Mississippi. He's in a assisted living home there, but he, you all know him from being here. So the effort was absolutely incredible. So that's your legacy. All of those people who planned and executed that operation were Vietnam veterans at the leadership level. All right. So that's why I'm proud to be a Vietnam veteran. I'm proud to be your membership chairman. <clears throat>